Vediamo. Buonasera a tutti. Good evening everyone. Now we're here uh, once again together. It's always very interesting to uh, be here with you. And uh, uh, this is one of the uh, last debates of this meeting. And we're going to talk about a uh, topic that uh, um, um, uh, was uh, uh, entitled uh, about the family, which is uh, somewhat troublesome. De familia in Latin. So talking about the family. Uh, there is a heated debate on the family. Uh, a lot of uh, things have been written, have been said. Uh, right now, uh, there is a lot of debate on that uh, in uh, a political, cultural and international level. So, uh, uh, we uh, chose this title which is somewhat troublesome because uh, we know that sometimes uh, uh, people are not uh, uh, too uh, detailed or precise about uh, this uh, uh, topic and uh, um, they, speak in the they speak in theoretical terms. The people uh, thinking about the titles uh, uh, of the debate uh, have been pretty much interested in this topic and we are very much interested in this topic because if we look at this big word family there's a lot of tradition there's a lot of history um, it has developed over the time in terms of meaning but what is striking today is that on the one hand there is a family marriage and these words uh, uh, show uh, uh, a lot of expectations, are related to big expectations, uh, they are related to uh, desires in uh, men and women of our times, uh, uh, which are very important desires, uh, basic desires, desire for company, help, solidarity, the desire to uh, 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 see in others uh, and to have from others a sense of affection, solidarity, love, uh, to have their presence, uh, which is what we need when we meet in, as human beings. So the family is a symbol of uh, the uh, relation completing, filling the uh, human being uh, that the human being uh, longs for because this is the only way it feels full. And so it is the archetype of relation because uh, it is also uh, a uh, basic relation because uh, we all have a family experience, uh, be it good or bad. So uh, uh, family is beautiful, marriage is beautiful and this attracts us. But uh, on the other end, at the same time, we are fully aware uh, of the uh, uh, existing context, of the existing situation where family and marriage are put under pressure, pressure are threatened and are undergoing a crisis. The Catholic Church uh, is uh, um, asking uh, a lot of questions and is questioning itself on this topic. This is a sign of the increase in awareness of the fact that the family is beautiful but it is difficult to live the family uh, in a sustainable way, in a satisfactory way, on a sound basis, so that the family can really meet its needs and uh, all our needs. So, um, the debate on family has always been of the utmost importance. Uh, so, we will think together, we will uh, um, reflect together and uh, um, we will give some uh, food for thought. Food for thought expressing a uh, position, but at the same time uh, talking about an experience. experience uh, which uh, can be positive and beautiful. So, uh, we're all here. I'm here with all the speakers to work together, to be together and to talk about the family together. This is an international panel. 
to my left you see uh, Professor Carter Smith from uh, University of Notre Dame, Indiana. Carter is a very big friend of ours of the meeting. He's been here with us for a few years. He always came to see us. And this year, something uh, um, important has happened because the University of Notre Dame is an official partner of the meeting. So we're really very happy that uh, 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 this friendship uh, has been formalized, so to speak. Many people came from Notre Dame uh, University, and many people come and uh, help at the meeting. Uh, can, can come and help at the meeting, also because the University of Notre Dame is uh, not only a place of culture but also a place for action. There are uh, uh, different centers in the university um, uh, helping, uh, supporting uh, poor families. Uh, uh, helping uh, 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 people who will have children and have some problems. Uh, so they have an educational task. Uh, uh, they uh, help to understand what family is, uh, is about. Uh, Orlando Carter Snead is the director of the uh, Center for Ethics and Culture, which is a very important center of the University of Notre Dame uh, because it is the ca it's very important because it is the Catholic soul of the university and he teaches bioethics and law. And he was also a very important uh, member of the uh, Bioethics Commission uh, under the uh, auspices of the US presidency. And then we have with us uh, Mrs. Chiara Giaccardi, another expert. Uh, she is uh, a professor of uh, uh, communication sociology and we'll be talking about this in this debate and uh, 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 she has uh, a uh, wonderful uh, family experience. We shouldn't mix up the public and the private but uh, because uh, hers is an open family, uh, welcoming people and supporting people. Uh, to my left, uh, you see Mrs. Anna Garriga, uh, who is a university professor. Uh, she, uh, she will uh, uh, speak about data, so her presentation is going to be very difficult. She wants to understand what is happening in our countries in terms of family, so you maybe will find it hard to listen to her, but her contribution is going to be very useful. So, welcome Anna, because uh, uh, she is young and uh, up until recently she was one of the volunteers at the meeting, whereas now she's one of the experts. So, as you can see, there's not only research, but uh, we will talk about um, um, our uh, experiences and our thoughts on this topic. Uh, and uh, this is why we will have uh, first uh, Professor uh, uh, Sneed speaking, then Anna Garriga, and then Chiara Giaccardi. But, uh, uh, so we will talk about a stance on the family which we think can really be useful for uh, uh, those of you wishing to listen to us and also can be used for uh, pluralism, where there are uh, uh, different experiences. But uh, first and more foremost, in order to meet uh, and uh, uh, to fight, uh, you must be willing to listen to others. So uh, I will now uh, give the floor to uh, Carter Sneed and the basic question and what he will be talking about is whether this family experience, which is so fascinating, so charming, so promising, how can we define this experience? How can the experience of the Catholic world, the uh, um, Christian world as a thought about the family, in, also in this new context and in these turbulent waters? So I'll give you the floor, uh, Carter. <sighs> Thank you, Lorenza. First of all, thank you very much for having me. This is, this is my fifth time speaking at the Rimini meeting. 
And the first time that the University of Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture, which I serve as director, is partnering with the Rimini meeting as a co-sponsor. We are honored by and excited for our nascent collaboration. On behalf of the Center for Ethics and Culture and the University of Notre Dame, I would like to express our profound gratitude for the hard work of those who make this remarkable event possible. Emilia, Marco, Roberto, Giorgio, and of course, the 2,000 extraordinary volunteers. Today I will offer... <laughs> Today I will offer a brief reflection on the family and its role as an answer to a question that bedevils modern man. Namely, who am I and what am I made for? That is, the family is the place where we learn an answer to this question that is truly human and truly befitting a creature made in the image and likeness of God. I will proceed first with a diagnosis of what I and others, including Pope Benedict and Father Caron, have referred to as the crisis of anthropology. I will next describe a false and dangerous answer to this question of human nature and human flourishing, namely the proposal of radical individualism. I will then briefly illustrate the perils of this false image of man with examples drawn from my field of public bioethics, the governance of science, medicine, and biotechnology in the name of ethical goods, particularly in the context of human procreation and the beginning of life. I will conclude by suggesting an alternative true vision of the human person and human flourishing marked by inalienable human dignity, reciprocal indebtedness, and solidarity. And most importantly for present purposes, I will propose that it is by living in a family that one learns these truths about who we are and why we were made. So point one is the crisis of anthropology. The American novelist Walker Percy famously wrote that we live in a deranged age, more deranged than usual, because despite great scientific and technological advances, man has not the faintest idea of who he is or what he is doing. This anthropological crisis bedevils modern man, who is confronted with the profound question of his identity, his destiny, and what he owes to his fellow man, and vice versa. This confusion is surely part of the lack of which our hearts are all of a sudden full. As Father Caron wrote in his 2006 address to the Pastoral Theological Congress, this crisis affects the family as well as the individual. Father Caron wrote, the crisis of the family is a consequence of the anthropological crisis in which we find ourselves. The way they approach their relationship, the way they conceive it, depends on the image each one has of his own life, of his self-realization. This implies a conception of man and his mystery. The question of the right relationship between the man and the woman, said Benedict XVI, is rooted in the essential core of the human being, and it is only by starting from here that its response can be found. In other words, it cannot be separated from the ancient but ever new human question, who am I? What is a human being? Somewhat paradoxically, however, I will argue later in the talk that while the success of the family depends on understanding who we are and our destinies, it is precisely by living and loving in the family that man learns the answer to these questions. But first, the false answer of radical individualism. 
There is a false and dangerous answer to the question of man's nature, identity, destiny, and shared life. That is the proposal of radical individualism. This proposal understands man as radically alone and isolated. It understands man not as a dynamic unity of body and spirit, but as solely a creature defined by his will. Thus, the most important fact about man under this false conception is that he is a chooser, a consumer of things. And man's highest flourishing is the construction and pursuit of projects of his isolated, lonely will. Under this view, there is no destiny. There are no natural or social constraints on the exercise of will. Man is a tabula rasa. Personal relationships with others are understood as merely instrumental and contractual. And importantly, the only obligations binding the radical individual will are those that he chooses. There are no unchosen obligations. Man encounters the other as isolated adversaries clad in the armor of our rights. Radical individualism poses a profound threat to our shared life together. This vision of the person as an merely an atomized will to power is not only false, but it's also dangerous. And it becomes clear when one considers the case of public bioethics, the governance of science, medicine, and biotechnology in the name of ethical goods, especially as public bioethics pertains to matters at the beginning of human life and human procreation. The false premise of radical individualism presents radical challenges to the identity and worth and even definition of human persons, the nature and meaning of human procreation, the nature of parental obligations to children, and the true ends of scientific inquiry and medicine. In the world of bioethics at the beginning of human life, the thesis of radical individualism restricts the circle of the human family and the domain of moral concern. When the person is conceived of as a mere will, whose highest end is the construction and pursuit of personal projects, those who are incapable of formulating and pursuing such goals are relegated to the domain of non-persons. The embryonic human being, the unborn child, the cognitively disabled, while indisputably living members of the human family, are deemed non-persons, which means they do not enjoy moral, moral concern, nor even the basic protection of the law from violence in the form of embryo-destructive research, abortion, and euthanasia. Consider also the flattening and corruption of the understanding of procreation itself under the radical individualist account of, of human flourishing and human procreation. First, Professor John Robertson, former chairman of the Ethics Committee of the most important professional society for assisted reproduction in America, wrote that the choice to pursue or avoid procreation is essential to self-definition, pursuit of desires, and self-expression. Professor Gerald Shatton, a famous geneticist at the University of Pittsburgh, likewise told the United States President's Council on Bioethics that the goal of assisted reproduction is to, quote, help parents realize their dream of a disease-free legacy. Put into practice, these thoughts take the forms of sex selection, genetic screening for preferred traits, including eugenic purposes, the commercial practice of surrogacy, where children do not, who do not meet a particular standard are rejected as one would reject a defective product, and even eventually, perhaps, the cloning of children. 
What is the child in this picture? She is a project, the object of her parents' will. She is a vessel into which her parent or parents pour their aspirations. She is a product to be accepted or rejected to the extent that she matches her parents' desires. I would suggest that this is where the false and dangerous ideology of radical individualism leads. But there is good news. This is a dark picture, I grant you. But the good news is that this false, deformed image of man as radically alone, atom an atomized consumer of things, and pursuer of self-invented projects cannot stand when set alongside the true identity of man, possessed of inalienable intrinsic human dignity, living in solidarity with others, in a condition of reciprocal indebtedness with duties towards others, including unchosen duties, from whom he is owed the same care by his fellow man. But where do we learn this true image of man and his identity? As I will argue, it is through living and loving in family that this truth about us and our destinies emerge. So first, what are these truths regarding the person? The truth is we are in all intrinsically equal in basic dignity simply because of who we are as members of the human family. Each and every human being is intrinsically valuable and irreplaceable regardless of her age, size, location, race, sex, usefulness or burdensomeness to others, her possession or lack of certain favored physical or mental capacities, or the worth assigned to her by others. It is thus morally incoherent and a grave injustice to exclude from the circle of persons the protection of the law who are immature, small, dependent, or incapable of high-level cognition. There is no such thing as a human non-person. There are no pre-personal human beings, as in embryos and fetuses. There are no post-personal human beings, as in cognitively disabled patients. All human beings are persons from conception to natural death. But where do we learn this truth about the dignity of human persons? It is in the school of the family. By first being cared for and loved unconditionally and then extending that same unconditional love to our children in the womb, our cognitively disabled loved ones struck by disease, injury, or even old age. In the ultrasound image or in the nursing home, we come to learn that we are all persons regardless of our cognitive powers, regardless of our ability to construct and pursue future directed plans. In the school of the family, we likewise learn the truth that we owe one another a reciprocal debt of love and care, whether we choose these obligations or not. We are not disembodied wills. We are profoundly vulnerable family members who rely on mutual beneficence for our very survival. We learn this in the school of the family. We know that our family cared for us at the beginning of life when we could not. And we must do the same for them when they are old and require the same kind of loving care. We also do not exist as isolated, atomized wills, merely separate and distinct selves disconnected from others. Rather, the truth is that we come to be and live situated in relationships to others, with connections of kinship to past, present, and future generations. This too we learn in the school of the family by living and loving those who came before us and those who will live on after us. 
And this conception of solidarity and community extends beyond our own families and serves as a cure for the failure of moral imagination that prevents us from seeing our neighbors clearly. Much injustice is driven by this failure or refusal to recognize the unseen other to whom we owe a duty of care. We see this failure of recognition with the victims of poverty and war and natural disasters. We see this in public bioethics at the beginning of life, especially regarding the unborn child in the womb or in the laboratory. We see this in public, we see the failure of parents to recognize their children. We see the failure of doctors to recognize their patients. The failure of our society to recognize its own members. This is more radical than the mere failure to love our neighbor as ourselves. This amounts to the failure to recognize our neighbor as a fellow human being. These failures of recognition emerge when we hear stories of those suffering in faraway places from natural disasters, war, and poverty. We perhaps understand intellectually these tragedies, but we don't feel the cries of our brothers and sisters in our hearts as we should. But here too, the family bridges this gap in our moral imagination. When we properly love our mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and grandparents, we understand that everyone we encounter is someone's child, grandchild, perhaps a mother or father, brother or sister. We see in them our own mother and father, daughter or son, brother and sister, and we feel bound to them, to care for them, as we wish they would if our loved ones were suffering. I am reminded by a comment by my wife in 2005 during the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in the American city of New Orleans. There was a family, this family, stranded on a bridge, stranded by the floods. My wife saw our family and the people stranded on this bridge with their little ones in arms, pleading desperately for help. And in that moment, my wife apprehended their suffering and fears not as a mere intellectual matter, but in her heart. And she understood in a deeper way the imperative that we respond to their cries. This is the school of the family at work. Finally, what does the family teach us about what we are for and our destinies? Family not only signals our common humanity, our inalienable dignity and our reciprocal indebtedness to one another. But family love, familial love points inexorably to the one who made us to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him ever, forever in heaven. It is in loving one another that we see the face of Christ. Thank you very much. Grazie, Carter, per Thank you very much, Carter, for this introduction to our topic and for clearing a number of concepts and the fact that what we experience within families is global. It's something that involves the humans as a whole and that this experience needs to be communicated. And I think that many of the families who are here and families in the world can say out loud that this is true. But as we said in the beginning, faced with this beauty and this sense of family, we're also going through difficult times because our societies are experiencing a drop in terms of demographic evolution of the fertility rate but also there's a sort of fragmentation of families. So establishing a relationship to another person is like a contract to wills to get together, a way to get benefits and assets and share maybe feelings, but then this is quite fragile as a union. And this is something that has to do with everybody. 
so it's hard to go beyond all that. But still, we want to focus specifically on these uh, quite difficult aspects relating to uh, families and family experience. So, Anna, I give you the floor and I ask you to follow these updates on your studies, telling us what it means to sort of look at family and family crisis. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a great opportunity for me to be here to tell you more about my research work and talk about this within the meeting. I have four children, I am a wife, and I do research work on families. So I literally live through what I'm researching on every day. And specifically, I try to study the consequences of separations in children and uh, in the society in general. When the Berlin Wall fell, I was just nine years old. And I must confess that personally, I go through the same doubts and uh, fears and concerns of any other parent. I've been invited to share with you the conclusions of my research work. I've also developed uh, several doubts, so there are still some open issues. So as you will hear, there are some little sort of battles that stem from my passion for debate, dialogue and exchange. Well, when it comes to families, uh, well, uh, many, many topics spring to mind. So, women's empowerment, uh, changes in our life experiences. So, I decided to focus on divorce because it has to do with so many family members, children, grandparents, parents. So, and before introducing you to my data, I would like really to ask you to be patient when listening to this data, but I really want to clarify why I started to apply statistical methodologies to this topic. I started my research work 10 years ago when in Spain there was a debate on some family laws approved by Zapatero government, including the so-called short divorcing procedure law. The first thing that I realized is that there were two two opposite positions, and there was no dialogue and connection between these two positions. On the one hand, there was uh, a many position trying to defend marriage, saying that marriage is uh, an asset of society, is good for society, and is based on some moral principles. Unfortunately, the vast majority of today's uh, Spanish society doesn't understand these values. So it doesn't start from experience. The second position, on the contrary, stems from the idea according to which uh, divorce is a uh, sort of uh, something positive, uh, letting women to be to have more freedom, and that it doesn't have any effect on children. So these two positions shared something actually, car because sorry. There was no strict correlation with scientific research work. So, some say that it is not necessary to study what it is self-evident. Others say that, okay, if there are no effects or repercussions of divorcing, well, why study that? So, so I think that some countries have gone over this dualism and have started studying this topic uh, using statistics. Well, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I mean, it's not uh, a history. 
of uh, sort of uh, great uh, uh, fights, but it's a history of uh, daily little battles and trying also to listen to those who have different ideas. So first of all, let's see then this issue of uh, divorce. So does divorce uh, generate more freedom and more equality or not? So this is the first key question. Is divorce a source of uh, freedom and well-being? For the vast majority of people, divorce uh, is uh, a sort of liberation from uh, pain and suffering, and in many cases this is the case. But data show us that uh, this has uh, negative repercussions on children, in educational, psychological, economic, and relational terms. Well, once people show that, well, then others say, okay, there may be negative effects, but then these negative effects will disappear with time. You will see, in my words, that uh, I will try to to criticize these arguments. First of all, divorce has uh, immediate reactions, but then uh, once the children will be grown up, so they won't have any uh, consequences anymore. But this is not true, this is not the case, because actually the negative repercussions remain also in relational terms, so, so children that went through the divorce of their parents have uh, many more probabilities of getting divorced themselves. Uh, also, there was to have uh, a sort of uh, low quality relationship. So it is not true that once you grow up, the effects disappear. Not at all. Sometimes, on the contrary, they tend to be even worse. I'm not saying that all children going through the divorce of their parents will go through this, but certainly there is an increase in the likelihood of some uh, events. A second issue is uh, the following. So the real problem is not really divorce, but something else. So poverty is the real issue. We know that actually in Spain and also in Italy, single parent families uh, are quite poor, up uh, a quite high number. But uh, if uh, these uh, numbers were to be reduced, uh, well, uh, maybe the situation wouldn't be so critical. So more than 25% of single parent families are poor. But we have seen that this is not the case. Even the children that live in the wealthy families still have negative repercussions in their lives resulting from divorce. Moreover, in Scandinavian countries where the poverty uh, rate of a single parent family is very low, well, in, very, in those very same Scandinavian countries, the children of divorced parents still go through negative repercussions, the same as for children of divorced parents in Italy and Spain. Moreover, if we compare different generations of uh, in Sweden, sorry, we see that um, there are no diminished, diminished effects of uh, divorce. So young people do not suffer less compared with previous generations, not at all. And then, last but not least, I would like to show you something else. I would like to show you another topic that, in my opinion, is one of the most important ones. The conflict. 
Very often, the conflict is a problematic element, and specifically the uh, sort of the conflict that precedes the divorce. And sometimes it is true. The conflict may lead to sort of major problems in children. According to recent research work, children that have gone through many conflicts before the separation of their parents affect, well, as a matter of fact, see the divorce as a liberation deed. They think their situation may improve, but uh, the children that uh, have not experienced uh, that high level of conflict before the divorce, well, actually do not share the same feeling. This kind of divorce is the most common one. And there's a great number of families that get separated without having gone through previous highly conflictual situations. And in my opinion, this is one of the main problems. As a consequence, can we state that uh, a divorce uh, leads to a greater level of uh, liberation and freedom? Well, sometimes yes, but in most cases, no. Second point, can there be more equality? For many people, the increase in the number of divorces is a positive thing. Currently, well, anybody can sort of separate. And certainly, I mean, the main reason for divorcing is not an economic reason. What we are seeing in the Western world Well, when the divorce rate in the past was lower or very low, people of highest social classes tended to divorce more and uh, more deprived people tended to divorce less. Well, today it's the other way around. So, there was a trend, there was a change in this trend, and this is particularly true for Spain, but certainly in Italy, this trend is to be seen as well. So, there are people who would like to have a, a long-lasting relationship but this is not possible. So is this wish depending on the social class? This is not an open question. But then there are, once again, repercussions for the kids. In the Western world, differences between rich and deprived children are growing. So there's a growing gap. And some data seem to confirm that uh, the growth of this gap between rich and poor children is due to the fact that poor children have a greater level of likelihood to live in a single parent family. Therefore, we are not going towards a society with fewer families, but let's say fewer families for more deprived classes. And actually, those are the classes that would need more families. Well, these are the data that I wanted to show to you. As a consequence, as far as I'm concerned, what can I say? Dialogue is very important and dialogue is possible also by using statistical data and we know that dialogue and exchange are at the heart of this event of the mating 
But uh, if we use statistics, we see that uh, a specific paradox emerges because uh, on the one hand, we have many, many divorces for less and less conflictual reasons. But at the same time, we see that marriage uh, in terms of long-lasting relationship, it's still um, one of the major wishes of uh, modern people. In the US, it seems that uh, youngsters who want a long-term relationship have increased over the last few years. And so, oddly enough, we have this wish on the one hand and a great problem in making this wish come true on the other hand. In my opinion, actually, having started this topic and being married myself, I can say that marriage per se is quite difficult. And now I would like to tell you why. I would like to tell you very clearly why we have this paradox. And I want to quote uh, this paradox. The paradox of love between man and woman. So we have uh, two sort of elements that clash against each other. So they need to be loved each other, to love each other, but they have a, a finite ability to love. And it is only within the horizon of a greater love they can sort of try to find a way. They do not, re they do not give up. They uh, walk towards each other within a flourishing, within a, a sense of fullness. So maybe one of the reasons of the many divorces is that maybe this try of approach has been forgotten. So the marriage proposed by our society is a bourgeois middle class marriage that is a self-referential telling us that yes, it is possible that um, actually it is possible to so to provide uh, stability to marriage. But as I, well, in, in my opinion, marriage is not perfect and is not so self-evident. It's a relationship that uh, fully is fully expressed uh, by the, these uh, uh, meetings uh, title. So what is this lack, a lack of, or heart of which all of a sudden you're full? And uh, so we see that uh, actually uh, this lack uh, is an engine. It's uh, a sort of consciousness and awareness of one's own limits. Uh, and this awareness is something that uh, stimulates reality, but also uh, the community and uh, the relatives, the dear ones, and the church. So without this marriage, which is a sort of incomplete without the other, so this marriage that generates a decentralized family open to the other, it is going to be more and more sort of difficult to protect a marriage from divorce. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you. Oltre averci fatto vedere. Thank you very much, Anna, for showing us these data that are very interesting. And uh, as uh, Professor Sneed did say, so we saw a perspective that we may define as religious. So a perspective showing us that man has infinite wishes that uh, are not easy to be sort of turned into something true. That it's hard to make them come true, but this is not a good reason to give up. I mean, uh, 
it is important to be aware of this lack. And again, this is something that has to do with all of us. I have a very dear friend who is younger than me, and uh, after getting married with uh, an unchristened person, well, then at one point she realized uh, that uh, she wanted also to marry in a religious way, and I asked myself, well, why? And she said, well, I'm starting to understand that between the two of us, in order to be really together, we need another entity. And again, this is not an ideological uh, sort of choice, but simply this lack is uh, a way to be open, is uh, a way to enrich yourselves, and so this can be a very fruitful way. That said, I think there is another thing to be considered. Well, there, there would be so many other things to be discussed within this topic. And sometimes uh, when a certain uh, sort of uh, approach to relationships and family is uh, expressed, well, that is like a sort of taking one stand. So it's like uh, expressing a position and uh, maybe stating something that can uh, generate the opposition of another person. So I would really like uh, to sort of exchange my views because uh, you can always learn from other people's words and experiences. So I would like to ask Chiara and I would like to ask her if, uh, I mean, uh, she has a specific experience in that respect considering also her sort of background. So what stage are we at? Is that just a matter of communication or can we really understand more what we do? Can we communicate better what we do? So what are we really able to exchange in a free way? So this is a quite common issue. This is a quite open issue, so we need to be aware on the fact that we need to work on that. So it's not about dogma, it's not about sort of stating principles. This cannot lead to a constructive dialogue. But now I would like to know what the Professor Jakarti can tell us about this. So I give her the floor. Intanto. Now, first of all, I would like to uh, thank, uh, thank you all for inviting me here. And I really wanted to be here with you, although uh, uh, I don't really feel very well. So uh, I do apologize in advance um, uh, if uh, I won't be crystal clear. In any case, uh, um, what I uh, will say uh, uh, has already been written in a text uh, which uh, today has been published by Il Sussidiario in newspaper. So, I will just uh, uh, give you first a short introduction and then I will make three remarks. The introduction can, uh, to some extent, answer Lorenza's question. Today it is increasingly difficult to talk about family for the people who want to talk about about the family in a good way because uh, uh, you don't have to be trapped by a common sense, a common risks, as in the rhetoric and also uh, uh, the crusades against the family, just as if uh, in order to state something you believe in, uh, you needed to fight against those uh, who have a different opinion. I'm deeply convinced uh, in the fact that uh, uh, when you see uh, the dark, uh, you don't have to go against the dark, but you have to switch on a light. As in, you don't have to complain about the dark, but you have to switch on the light. Uh, the world is rapidly changing uh, and is increasingly making reference uh, to something solid. But uh, the family is not a monolithic, it's uh, something which is not flexible, but rather dynamic. It is something always on the change, changing. And uh, solidity, soundness, uh, clarity 
are uh, uh, somewhat not related to the family today and does not help us uh, in talking about the family in public de de debate. The family is not an ideal. Family is a reality, an imperfect reality, as Anna said, a lacking reality, a, uh, um, a reality uh, where there are always mistakes and failures every single day, but it is a resilient realent reality which can accept the mistake, which can uh, go on by forgiving the other, and uh, which is able not to give up and to be old open, is uh, flexible, is dynamic, uh, and uh, it continues its adventure. So let's uh, start using a different language, uh, which is not a theoretical language, uh, but rather a language based on the ideological battle. If we have an experience to tell, just let's tell our experience, let's tell our story. This is the best way to communicate what the family is about. Now, this is the introduction. Then my first remark, as Guardini said in the 1950s in its book, in his book The Ethics, the family is under attack. There is a tendency to question the family and to dissolve the family. So the attack against the family is not uh, uh, something occurring these days, these times, depending on the new traditions and beliefs. The family uh, has always been there, has always ex existed, because it is the place where we resist against individualism, where the individual is put into a system, is absorbed by a system. Hence, it can be a danger for the system, where it is uh, much easier to uh, 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 fragment and to divide. So there is no golden age of the family that we have to regret where everybody was supporting the family. This is not the case. However, we believe uh, uh, I believe that uh, the enemies of the, family, the, of the family are not just outside the family, but we ourselves uh, very often cannot defend the family. And that's because uh, sometimes the family is too theoretical. It's a model that should be better than other models. I was struck by a sentence uh, by Bonhoeffer saying, the people who love their sense of communion more than the communion itself it will destroy the communion. And this also applies to the family. If we love an abstract model more than the family itself, we risk destroying the family because the family is not an abstract model, is not an ideal. The family is a very strong practical alliance. So, when we defend uh, the model in itself, uh, uh, we uh, do something bad for the family, I think. Also because uh, Orlando before was talking about the radical individualism. The family uh, uh, in itself is not against uh, radical individualism, the, its crisis uh, is connected to the fact that the family has not been able, uh, as uh, as englobed this uh, model of individualism, uh, which is why the family has lost its nature. Oftentimes, we see at the restaurant families where um, everybody is looking at the smartphone, uh, or uh, uh, families uh, that. Uh, are uh, places where uh, each person is leading their own life and uh, are just uh, thinking about uh, uh, their, uh, their lives and their advantages. Uh, this is not what the family is about. Uh, the family is not somebody, uh, a place, an entity which is closer to the outside world. This is not the form of the family that we have to defend because the family is open to life so that does not only mean that it is against abortion, but that it is ready to welcome, that uh, the doors of the family are open, that the family is not afraid of the other. It means that uh, it has a solidarity to the other. For example, 
seeing the reaction of many Catholic families uh, on uh, the uh, problem of migrants uh, shows that we are the first ones to betray the family. So the enemies of the family are not just outside the family. First and foremost, uh, we have to uh, understand that we cannot enhance this enormous asset, this rich asset that we should protect. My second remark. The family must be protected because I believe it is the only one or one of the very few places where we can experience, we can walk together. We can understand some truths and we can understand some human di dimensions which could not be accessed to from elsewhere. For example, and there are many of them, in a world where everything is effective, where efficiency is the most important thing, everything is planned, everything is organized, the family is the place of the lack of, ineff of efficiency, of inefficiency, where nothing works, where uh, you waste time, uh, where uh, um, uh, you, where where we understand that uh, there are constraints, uh, there are limits, but uh, where there is constant change, things are constantly in motion, and the model of efficiency of the family is not based on the economic model. So in the family, you can experience a different dimension, a human dimension, where time is different, where uh, um, uh, you have to uh, get organized with the others. For example, I cannot go on holiday because my children are sick, but this is not a, a problem, this is not a tragedy, because that uh, teaches me that uh, this is not that important, and this is a school of freedom teaching us freedom. The family is one of the uh, uh, very few uh, uh, places where uh, uh, things are very practical. In a world which is increasingly theoretical, even the human being is becoming increasingly theori theoretical. Even homosexuality is old-fashioned because uh, there is the it, the neutral, which is the sex of the machine. It is maximum theory. and. Uh, In a world which is becoming increasingly uh, theoretical, where transhuman is non-human, where there is a dual approach which is no longer body and spirit, but body and power, where the body becomes uh, an obstacle to the development of power, where uh, constraints, limits must be overcome by uh, uh, enhancing my performance uh, through uh, uh, biotechnologies or through different substances. Family is the place where my lack can be overcome by having a relation with the other. So it's through the relations with the other that uh, you can develop yourself in the family. And in the family, you can see the power, the power of the alliance, uh, helping people to overcome limits which become an opportunity to have relations with others. It's a, in a world where we count everything. We measure everything in this world. We count everything, starting from uh, our weight, uh, our heartbeats, that we check when we go jogging, the likes, the followers, the Twitters, all the quantified self, uh, myself, uh, has a value if uh, uh, there's a certain number of followers, if it is justified by numbers. In a world, I was saying, where uh, everything is counted, the family is the place uh, where uh, you can tell stories, uh, when you have relations, when you keep things and people together. 
story is absolutely fundamental in the family and it's something uh, that uh, uh, we have forgotten because now children are in front of televisions and tablets uh, and uh, uh, stories uh, are of the utmost importance because they keep memories alive and can uh, enable us to convey uh, uh, something to our children and a freedom to our children. Maria Zambrano said something very important in this context. That without conveying this message and this freedom, uh, there is a lack of humanity. Maria Zambrano wrote, you can really live only when you convey something. Living uh, in a human dimension means uh, conveying, offering, Pope Francis says that, that time is higher than space. Family is it's not just people living together. Pe uh, family is something which is based on history and which will have a future. And we are just um, um, a ring of the chain of, the, of history. And this is what we can learn in the family. In a world where everything is chosen and uh, where freedom means uh, the number of possibilities to choose, uh, so, basically, you are free if you can choose as much as you want and if you can choose everything. Well, in a kind of world like this, uh, uh, in the family, you can be as free as you want while not making choices. The most important relations are those that we have not chosen. So. This is why we have to enhance them. This is why we have to be grateful. And in our gratefulness, we have to build something good. What is chosen uh, is important, but uh, there is more to that. Uh, even the non-choice is important. And in some cases, uh, uh, when you live with others, uh, uh, others can uh, bother you. Others want to use my time. Others uh, uh, want to overlap with me. That, so others could be a constraint. Uh, but this is an enormous opportunity to be free and to get free from oneself. Because uh, when we say that we do something that we want, uh, that we choose what to do, we are actually trapped by our customs, by our beliefs, by our traditions. So what is freedom? It is freedom choosing among 50 or 100 products where advertising tells us the product that we have to choose. Choice is important. But it is important to be free and to exercise one's freedom. And the family is where we learn to do that. I like an expression by Anna Arendt saying that the only freedom that we have is the uh, freedom in conditions of non-sovereignty. While at present, the world tells us that the self is the master of himself, that uh, the self can decide about everything, including whether to be male or female, whether to be fluid or not, as if what we are does not depend on what has created us, it does not depend on the relations we have with others, other people expecting something from us. But that does not limit our freedom. This, uh, is, uh, uh, this protects our identity. That helps us uh, in giving sense to what we do and to our life. Uh, so the fact uh, of uh, uh, wanting to be the Almighty is the opposite of uh, uh, freedom. And the family teaches us what uh, living freedom is. In a world uh, made of individuals, uh, and Orlando was mm, speaking about uh, radical individualism, the family is teaching us uh, 
something with the experience and is teaching us that uh, the relation is more important than the individual. We are individuals because we were in a womb and because uh, we are born from male and female. Today you can buy, you can rent, but uh, regardless of everything, we are born from a womb and therefore uh, the surrogate the surrogate person is the one who has bought, uh, not the one who has given, because there's a link in one way or another, because whoever has had the children knows that there's a specific dialogue between the mother and the child she's bearing in her womb. This is not ideology, this is experience. We are all born from a mother. Ideology is the opposite, as in those who believe that this is not important. Siamo relazione. We are relations, much more than individuals. And we are individuals because we come from a relation. So this is what the family teaches us. The family is a second womb uh, where we learn a language, where we learn uh, 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 knowledge, when we learn uh, experience, where uh, uh, we convey skills and uh, you tell stories. But the family now is the only school telling us that relations are more important than individuals. Third remark. Now, the first remark was uh, the, uh, the fact that we don't have to fight uh, uh, ideological ba battles. We have to talk about the experience. We have to convey the experience. We have to tell our own stories, which uh, should not belittle other people's stories, but uh, we should tell our stories to share uh, our story, to share our richness. And let's talk about practical experience. We don't need to uh, talk about uh, philosophy or doctrines. So we have to be very practical, and this is fundamental. And then uh, uh, the community. The family is not uh, a nest, uh, but um, it is um, um, a part and parcel of a net. Hospitality. Um, it is uh, uh, the place uh, that can welcome uh, uh, people. Because uh, this is uh, the family educates us in what we are. I don't understand why a young boy should desire something else other than the family. My third remark is the following. If everything is connected, as Pope Francis says, the family is not the only school where we learn something, but right now, at this time of great challenges, the family is a laboratory where we can test the new solutions to tackle problems. For example, I believe that the crisis of the family and uh, immigration, the problem of immigration, uh, are not two separate problems uh, that must be tackled uh, on an individual basis, but rather they are two important issues uh, that can be solved together, that can be debated together, and that can offer new uh, uh, ways to uh, welcome people. Uh, uh, families, for example, uh, working with refugees, uh, uh, families working with migrants, uh, uh, families helping uh, minors. This is good for the family because the family can once again become the womb uh, of the family itself. Family is no longer in crisis if it looks outside, if it opens to the outside. And if it comes, it, if it comes out with new ideas of living, the apartment is a Ford idea, is an individual idea. There's not much money. 
apartments are very expensive. Uh, uh, people uh, who uh, are not too rich uh, find it difficult to survive. So families must be put in a condition to uh, build uh, forms of uh, co-living, uh, co-existing. We can be very creative uh, as families uh, if we test uh, something new and some new forms of living. To conclude, uh, I will quote uh, uh, Giussani. Pope Francis says that everything is connected. Uh, and I think that uh, this is uh, a very important uh, statement uh, because everything is atomized, uh, everything is disconnected, uh, and uh, uh, this has made us uh, uh, short-sighted and unable to take on uh, uh, today's challenges. Giussani says that everything is connected uh, and that uh, there is uh, a new dimension of uh, reality. There is a promise a promise of happiness, a promise uh, that we have to fulfill and that we have to convey and that we must protect, uh, helping one another because no one, no family can uh, do it on its own. Thank you. Bene, grazie anche a Chiara. Thank you very much, Chiara. Thank you very much because, uh, well, the starting point of this meeting was uh, Abraham. So, man getting awareness of himself after being chosen by God. So, let's uh, close our debate on the family and well, family is a form of alliance too. It's not perfect. People can learn uh, forgiveness, welcoming, acceptance. So you can learn unconditional love within a family. You can learn a lot about what you have not chosen. Any human relation at one point reaches a limit and then you experience sort of this sort of conflict situation so but then you can also perceive this sense of mystery and uh, difficulty of uh, these kind of uh, situation so we really need to understand that uh, this is a possibility i don't know if you saw the exhibition on water and probably by watching the exhibition, you could think, well, I had never thought about these aspects of water, the fact that ice floats, and this is so important. How is it so that I never realized uh, the extent of such mysteries? Well, we did it with Abraham, with water. So we have really tried to focus on so many topics. So we f end up on the family, a great alliance encompassing many players. And so there's room for everybody from the different, the rich, the poor, the big, the small, provided that uh, we are really open to each other. There is the freedom to say God is uh, sort of uh, has a, is big and so this gives me the strength to go anywhere. So if you want to get to know more about Notre Dame University, there are some brochures out of the room. And as you know, the meeting goes on. And so see you next year.